record this for anybody that's watching offline. Um, so yeah, it might be not too long today. We don't have a whole lot more to cover. I just want to go over uh, one or two things uh, that we didn't mention yet uh, that will be on the assignment five. Um, so speaking of that, uh, I still don't have the assignment five posted. I'm still working on it, uh, but uh, yeah, hopefully look for that today or tomorrow. Um, um, and um, I'm still going to uh, have a due date of that next week. So, but we will, uh, I will have it posted here and uh, we can go over some of the details of it um, Tuesday uh, uh, next week while people are working on it. So, uh, so uh, to finish up, um, um, I, actually, I, I wanted to maybe go back over a little bit of some of the stuff that we did get to last time. So, you know, we, we talked through the voting classifiers and then we talked relatively quickly about the bagging and the pasting. Um, uh, just to um, kind of summarize some of the things on that. Uh, I don't know how helpful these uh, figures are from the textbook, but um, you know, the, the first one we talked about, the voting classifiers, uh, they aren't really, in my experience, used that much, except for maybe in real specialized uh, kind of a, um, a competition. In fact, uh, it's really kind of more like boosting. So uh, that's the main thing I want to kind of get to and talk to today, because uh, I asked you to do a little example of boosting on the assignment five, okay? But uh, anyway, so the, the voting classifier is the idea, um, this is what we mostly talked about on Tuesday, is you know, you're kind of handcrafting diverse estimators, diverse predictors using different uh, algorithms um, and then combining their predictions. Um, so the easiest just being um, some sort of majority vote or like we showed, you can do something slightly more sophisticated so you can take into account the um, the certainty of each of the predictor using in scikit your learn using the the probability so the prediction probability function that each predictor gives you uh, to weight their votes uh, in some way. So um, then you know I, maybe I wasn't explicit enough on this last time, but I think uh, bagging and pasting uh, th this is much more common uh, when we. When, when we think about uh, ensembling a bunch of estimators uh, into one uh, predictor. Um, so yeah, th this is, again, a similar figure to the one before, but uh, kind of a good summary of it. So really what we're normally doing for an ensemble uh, is something like this. We're actually uh, creating a bunch of different classifiers, uh, and, and we do them by sampling. Uh, from the training data, right? So all these classifiers that we build, so all these predictors that we build, so it can be classifiers or it can be regressors. So, so both of these uh, uh, voting classifiers and these kinds of bagging or, or um, um, uh, pasting classifiers, they, they can work both for classify, classification or for regression. Um, so uh, for the, the, the simplest straightforward idea of this is, is we're sampling uh, just uh, each one of them is only being trained on a subset of the inputs of the training data, right? Uh, more sophisticated, you can also sample on the features, especially if you have a large number of features. Uh, you can um, uh, sample only a, you know, a, a small percentage of the features for each of your predictors on an ensemble like this. And if I wasn't clear before, I mean, really, you know, the, the textbook presents these, but that's really just what a random forest and extra tree is. And random forest and extra trees and some other variations like that are used a lot, right? But they are really just bags of decision trees, um, so collections of decision trees that have, have been trained on s some sub-portion, some sample portion of the training data, okay? Um, so it's, it's easy to do that. So I, I, I probably didn't mention some of the advantages of that. So one of the, um, um, the big advantage, you know, is performance-wise is you can, you can easily parallelize and scale this kind of ensemble, 
up to really big data sets because I can, I can sample and train each of these individuals completely independent of one another. Right? So if I need to make a million decision trees uh, on, that are sampled from a very small sub-portion of my input data, um, I can do that and just uh, shove them out to a million processors on a big cluster or something. Uh, and they can all train in parallel. Um, so you can, you can in, in a, about the time it would take to train one of them, you can get a large number of them trained if you have a big enough kind of cluster and can, can just do them in parallel since they're completely independent of each, each other. You only need to combine them after they've been trained um, and you want to make a, an overall prediction on new data that you haven't seen, in which case you have to ask all of the ones you've trained to give you a prediction and then combine them, um, you know, either using like hard voting or um, some other kind of aggregation method like we talked about. So, uh, technically, this is kind of a good uh, summary. So this kind of a bagging or a pasting uh, ensemble uh, generally, um, you know, it, it won't necessarily perform better than if I just train like a single decision tree or, or a single predictor on the data. Um, uh, it'll, have, it'll have a similar bias, but it'll tend to have lower uh, variance than just doing a single predictor. Okay? So that, that's kind of one thing. So, so uh, it'll, it'll be similar, uh, but um, um, uh, be better um, on this bias variance trade-off that we talked about. And, you know, performance-wise, if you've got the resources, um, you know, it would take a long time to train a single predictor on a really large data set, whereas I could train a large number of simple predictors on small subsets of a large data set in all in parallel. So, um, so that was, you know, uh, I didn't probably emphasize that last time, but that was just kind of a summary. With the, we talked about the bag and the pasting, um, you know, and, and hopefully you should be familiar with some of the nuances of the other stuff that we talked about uh, here on Tuesday uh, in terms of um, um, our, you know, our, our textbook gives terms to these. Bagging um, is the sampling uh, uh, with replacement, whereas uh, so the, the difference between that and pasting is that uh, just whether you're sampling with or without replacement. Um, and also be aware that we can sample both on the inputs um, and uh, sample on the features. Um, so, and uh, if you're sampling on, you know, uh, features, again, I'm, I haven't run across these technical terms very often except for in this textbook, so I don't know how many people call these patches and subspaces, but, uh, but really, you know, these are just names for sampling on the features or sampling on, uh, or sampling both on uh, a subset of the inputs and the features at the same time uh, where you get the uh, subspaces uh, I guess according to this textbook. So, um, okay, and that's kind of where we left off uh, last time. So let's, let's go on to new, um, 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 we did talk a little bit about the out-of-bag evaluation so if you are sampling with, uh, with with or without replacement. Um, there can be some of your uh, estimators in your ensemble, uh, so, uh, depending on how you do it, but many of them might have been trained on, have many of the, the inputs that they weren't trained on. So uh, those are the out of bag items for an individual estimator of an ensemble. The, the thing that's nice about those is that this is another way to estimate performance on unseen data. Uh, so instead of doing cross-validation, if you're using an ensemble like this and you've got estimators uh, that were only trained on portions of the input data, you can uh, get kind of an estimate of how they'll do on unseen data by using, uh, seeing how they perform on those out of bag, out, out of, on those data that they haven't been trained with. Right? So that's really all that the out of bag evaluation um, is, is about that we talked about. So um, on the new stuff, um, it is good to be familiar with random forest and extra trees, and there are lots of other variations of these. 
but you know to cut to the chase a, a random forest is really just this a, a bagging ensemble like we talked about of decision trees um, so as an extra tree an extra tree both variations of this kind of a sampling um, ensemble uh, that we talked about last time but uh, all, using just a decision tree as the estimator right so um, it's I, I don't know I mean you know it just makes sense um, I mean you can do a bagging ensemble using different kinds of estimators, a support vector classifier, or something like that. But uh, because of the properties of the way decision trees works, it's especially easy to, uh, if I go back to this figure, um, it's especially easy to just train a whole bunch of decision trees uh, and limit them um, on, you know, on your samples and limit them in other ways like the depth and stuff like that in order to get, a, a, even though you're using all the same method for your predictors, uh, you can get a very uh, diverse result uh, uh, from the, that kind of sampling um, and doing other parameters by doing an, an ensemble of decision trees. Um, so, Um, so that means that really uh, that there are, if we're using scikit-learn, there are specific special um, um, classes uh, to create a random forest classifier. There's a random forest regressor if you, if you want to do regression using a random forest ensemble. Um, and uh, Let me run everything above the cell so I can rerun these cells here. Um, and there's a, there's a, uh, but I won't jump ahead here, so I'll talk about the difference between extra trees and random forests. So, um, so yeah, like it's, like we're showing here, and again, this is probably directly from the textbook. Um, so you can use the, the random forest or the extra tree. Um, so here we just uh, use the random forest classifier from Second Learn uh, to train on the data set we've been using for this notebook um, and got like an accuracy score on some test data, 90% uh, in this case. Uh, so this was probably the, the same moons data that we were using uh, last time, so a made up uh, binary classification task here. So. Um, So the, the default for like a random forest, uh, or well, we specified some, some things here, but you know, all the, the meta parameters for a random forest, um, you know, we can, we can specify how many decision trees we want it to train with the number of estimators. Uh, the individual properties like the max depth, uh, max leaf nodes, all those other things we can specify. So in this case, all 500 of the decision trees will use those limits uh, whatever limits you specify uh, when when training them, right? Um, and this here, so this is just tr showing that this should be equivalent. So you can do this by hand. Um, so you can create a bagging classifier where you say, I want to use decision tree classifiers, uh, 500 of them. Um, and um, I guess we should have specified uh, like the max leaf nodes. I don't know why we didn't. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Max leaf nodes when we created our classifier here, right? Um, so, I mean, that's really all a random forest is doing. Like in scikit-learn, it hides that from you, but it's, it's doing that bagging classification using some same defaults for things like uh, whether to use sampling with or without replacement and some other stuff. Um, and what it samples for each of the uh, uh, the 500 estimators in this case that you create um, and so on, right? Um, so, so yeah, I mean the the kind of the big issue when doing an ensemble like this using uh, bagging or pasting um, is 
doing stuff to make certain that uh, since we're using the same um, method for all of our predictors to, to do something with our sampling or other stuff so that they're, they're all, you know, non-homogenous, kind of to use a technical term, that, that they are really uh, some significant differences between uh, all of the predictors that we're ensembling together in terms of what data they work well with and, and how they perform on different portions of the data and stuff like that. So, um, so yeah, and, and you know, the, the, the defaults uh, of the way it does that, uh, like if you use the, the, the random force class from scikit-learn, is it will usually work fairly well most of the time in terms of trying to make certain you get a diverse population of, of estimators um, as a result. Right? Um, So, uh, what, extra trees, I mean, you know, um, I um, uh, had to remind myself kind of what the difference is. So, uh, sometimes, you know, the, the defaults for basic random forest of decision trees maybe doesn't give you enough of a diversity in the, the population, so you need to do stuff to, to make them even more random. So, you know, that, that's all that the extra is referring to here is extremely randomized uh, in the name. Um, so, uh, right, when, when we're training the decision trees for a random forest classroom fire, the, the decision trees, uh, each individual one is fit uh, using, like, CART, using the, the algorithm that we talked about before, right? So in that case, at each point uh, uh, where we're making a decision, um, we are picking the optimal feature uh, among the features that we sampled if we did some feature sampling, but we're picking the optimal feature and the optimal uh, decision point on that feature to maximize those impurity scores, right? So we talked about that last week. So, um, so yeah, I guess the basic difference for uh, like an extremely randomized tree is to loosen that up even more. So um, instead of always picking the best feature to maybe be using a random feature, um, uh, rather and and uh, and or um, something uh, that that might not be the best possible threshold. So, so picking a non-optimal threshold at a particular point. So, um, so yeah. I mean, from my own experience, uh, I. I'm sure there's there's some cases where an extra tree will give you a boost in performance over just using a random forest. Uh, but they're often give you about similar performance usually with just using the defaults. So depending on your data set and what you're doing, you might have to uh, explore your meta parameters to get one or the other to uh, work better uh, than the other one uh, on a particular data set with a particular set of features and things. So, but there are things you can try. Um, you know, for me, I would usually reach for like a random forest if I wanted to compare a couple of different basic methods and see how it's uh, uh, doing on, on a particular data set. Um, so. um, so yeah, yeah. The, the the in theory, what's happening for these uh, um, extra trees is. Um, Is, is just playing around with um, the diversity of the population of estimators that you end up with. So, um, okay, uh, and uh, another thing, um, I do want people not to skip over this part as well. So we have, well, in this class, I don't think we've discussed it too much at length. Uh, actually, at the very beginning, we talked a little bit about um, when, when we were talking about data cleaning and things like that, about uh, doing some analysis of the features, uh, maybe doing some feature engineering in order to create some features that will work better uh, for an estimator than the, the original features that you're given and things like that. So um, um, it's always 
one of the basic things you do with like a new data set, if I need to build a, a, an estimator for it, um, is uh, when I'm exploring it, I want to look at the features in a more detail uh, of the data that I have uh, and, and, and try and figure out, you know, which features are important and which ones aren't, right? So sometimes you've got features that are redundant with other features and you can just drop them. They, they don't add anything to the performance of an estimator and they just slow down training. Um, uh, you know, sometimes, I mean, the, the features might be useful, but definitely some of them will be much more useful than others. So even if a feature isn't just redundant with, with some other features, uh, it might not be adding very much of anything at all. So again, you know, kind of performance reasons. Uh, if, if you're talking about really large data sets uh, that you need to build, uh, you know, some sort of an estimator in a production environment for, um, it's it's good if I can get pretty much about the same performance, but only using a tenth of the features. Then you know that that trade-off, even though the performance might dip a little bit, uh, I can train it in you know a minute instead of days or weeks. Um, 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 so that kind of stuff is, is, is what we're getting at here. There's, there's lots of different methods for uh, estimating the importance of features in a data set in terms of, of the quality of the, um, the, the, the final classifier that you can get from it. Um, so one thing you can use um, is uh, ensembles, uh, like random force. So, um, um, so yeah, because of the way that decision trees are built uh, when we train them, um, it's likely that the important features will end up near the root of the tree because they will end up being the ones that will give you the biggest uh, gain in terms of those impurity scores that we talked about, right? So, so often... Um, the, the, the most important feature will be at the top or near the root of your decision tree. So if you're only creating one decision tree on all the features, um, you can use that as a rough estimate of, um, of, of, um, of the, the, the ranking of how important uh, features are, of how, where they uh, first occur in the decision tree and are used uh, for building the decision tree. Um, so, uh, and the same argument so for random forests, uh, so, so even if you're using an ensemble, um, um, so the, the, the difference on that, let's say that we're, we're not sampling features, so we're using an ensemble of trees that are using all the features. So, uh, but, but they're just doing it on different subsets of the input data. So again, in, a, in that case, you would expect to get different trees, but uh, uh, the, the features that are more important uh, to, to making good estimators uh, are going to appear uh, much more often near the tops of those trees if we're randomly sampling on the inputs than the features that are less important. Okay. So, so in particular, uh, this is actually just built in because uh, people uh, realize that and, and use that all the time um, um, as one thing that a random forest can give you um, is a, a ranking, you know, from the most important to the least important features, right? Um, and, uh, you know, I'm just describing this kind of um, um, non, um, uh, not very precisely here. Um, but um, 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 it's easy to build a mechanism like that. So, you know, you, you create a bunch of decision trees um, uh, and then you just, f uh, for every feature uh, on the data set that you're using, you find the first, you know, how, what depth that feature was first used in every decision tree. Uh, and then like the average of that uh, will tell you the average depth that each feature occurs at and then you sort those. Um, and, you know, so, I mean, that's kind of one way, one idea of how you might implement uh, an estimate of the feature importance using a bunch of decision trees, right? So, you know, if the average, if, if on average it occurs at depth one or two, 
that feature is more likely to be uh, important than something who, that whose average is down a depth of five or ten or, or lower um, uh, when you do something like this. So you know you don't have to implement that uh, by hand. Uh, that's built in. Um, so you know you might not use a random forest ultimately as an est as the best you know, a uh, uh, classifier on a data set, but when you're doing some data analysis um, on a classification task, um, or, or, or this works both for classification or regression, so if, if you're uh, doing some preliminary data um, um, exploration, um, you can use this feature of random forests to uh, uh, try and estimate the ranking of, of which features would be the most use, useful to which would be the, the least useful uh, in the data set that you have. So, um, so this example probably comes directly from the textbook. Um, so just using the Irish data set that we've uh, seen multiple times, um, we can build a random forest with 500 estimators and um, 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 ask to what the, the feature importance were. Right. So we're, we're pulling out the feature importance uh, for each uh, feature that we have here. Um, so in this case, the, the higher sco the score is, the more important the feature is. So I, I don't know exactly how it normalizes these. So, uh, but, we, but yeah, the, 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 these scores are probably some uh, things. So the sum of the, uh, the uh, important scores sums up to one. So if you look at that, our four features probably sum up to one there. Um, and the most important feature will have the highest important score down, down to the lowest one that we have. So, um, so in this case, for the Irish data set, we only have the four features, uh, but it seems like the, the, the pedal length and width are doing much more, uh, are much more important in terms of, of classifying into our three iris types in this data set than the other two would be. Um, oh, uh, yeah, another, again, these are probably just all directly from the textbook, but um, we might ask, um, um, uh, using the MNIST data set, uh, the importance of the ranking of the, the pixels. So remember from the MNIST that we've got um, uh, uh, images that are 28 pixels by 28 pixels that we're trying to classify into a digit, zero, zero through nine. So I think uh, you will be using the MNIST data set on the assignment five. Um, so it's, it's maybe good to remind you about this. So um, um, right now, um, uh, almost have assignment five ready to post, uh, but, but yeah, you will be using MNIST for at least part of it uh, for building some ensembles. Um, so, this might have been a mistake, though, that uh, is relatively big. So the MNIST data set has like 60 or 70,000 uh, images. And there, finished finally. Um, so, and we're training on um, uh, like all the data here. We didn't split out anything for testing. So, uh, but, but, you know, that if you were doing data exploration and you're just interested in estimating the importance of your features, you might want to go ahead and, and uh, do your feature uh, importance estimations on all the data, uh, you know, because you don't really need to do a split uh, here if you're just interested in doing some exploration uh, to figure out uh, which features might be more or less important. This shouldn't be surprising. So here, again, we're coloring by the, uh, the, the uh, value that's returned for the feature importance, but we're going to have... 28 times 28 of these. So if we plot those as a, as a figure, of course the pixels in the middle are going to be more likely where people were drawing the numbers just because of how the data was normalized and centered and everything. Uh, so those will be the ones that uh, uh, if I'm doing a decision tree are going to be most, most important for determining what the class is. And uh, the pixels around the edge uh, normally didn't end up getting any ink, so you wouldn't. You could pretty much ignore all the stuff out here um, 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 when you're building a classifier like this. So. Um, okay, yeah. So that's 
uh, that, that's a good thing. There are some other methods. I should probably add some of those in there. Uh, but this is a basic one, and, and it works. So uh, uh, thinking ahead for the course, um, uh, another thing we can do is something like a principal component analysis. So principal component analysis is another common way to estimate uh, feature importance. So uh, we'll see another one uh, in the last um, two or three weeks of this course when we talk about um, unsupervised learning um, uh, mech, uh, algorithms. Um, okay. So, and then finally, like I said, the, the day might be a little bit re relatively short here, but um, the one thing I definitely wanted to go through uh, was to talk about the boosting, because I do ask you to do that in the assignment five. Um, um, so, uh, Um, I want to skip over the A to boost here. Um, let's just look at um, mostly uh, um, Yeah, let me just jump right to here, the, to the thing about uh, stacking here, because what I actually kind of do on the assignment five is really this kind of stacking here, as is described in the textbook. So, um, and um, um, it's, it's not really mysterious. So all we're doing is the, the same kind of thing that we did for the voting classifier. So the typical idea of, of doing sort of a stacking ensemble like this is we create some um, uh, diverse uh, classifiers, uh, diverse estimators by hand, uh, potentially by hand. So this is, this is often done like uh, in the context of like a competition or something where, again, you might have explored some different ways of trying to uh, uh, build a, a good performing model for a data set. Uh, and then you want to try and get out some uh, a last few extra percentage points of performance by ensembling different um, predictors uh, together in some way. Right? So you can first just try uh, like a voting classifier, uh, like we talked about uh, last Tuesday. So just uh, have your individual um, estimators, um, uh, and then combine their predictions like with a vote, so the majority vote. Um, so a more sophist sophisticated idea, though, uh, on stacking is that uh, all of your diverse uh, estimators um, will give you a result. Um, so um, here, um, uh, this might be more like if, if we were doing something for a, um, a regressor, right? But so imagine that, our, that uh, we're doing classification uh, like, you, like you'd be doing for assignment five. Uh, so in that case, each one of the predictors would be outputting uh, just a category, like zero, one, two, or it's an, if you're working on the MNIST data set, it would be outputting the digit it, it predicts from the input, so zero through nine. Right? Um, so instead of doing hard voting, though, you can imagine it in some circumstances circumstances it might be um, it might actually improve performance a little bit to uh, build a new classifier that takes the uh, predictions at, from all of your other estimators as inputs um, and you train a model on those uh, to give the final output prediction right so it, instead of doing something simple like majority voting we're building another level of, of an estimator, right? So, and again, you know, the estimator could be any type of, of uh, algorithm that we talk about in this class. So, you know, you can use a support vector machine or a random forest or whatever um, to, to combine the predictions um, and give a final prediction, right? So the, the idea on that is that for a sufficiently large and complex 
uh, data set, uh, it might be the case that, you know, this predictor uh, is only good, uh, you know, should only be trusted for kind of this subset of the data. And this predictor does better on this other subset. Uh, and simple majority voting, or even um, just using the, the the soft voting, using the confidence, might not uh, be able to learn uh, uh, the 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 exact kind of pattern of where predictors are good or bad on which portions, which subsets of the data set. So that's the hope of this kind of uh, uh, the stacking uh, sort of. Um, Ensemble uh, uh, that I wanted to talk about here is uh, it, it's a, it's a it's a straightforward idea. Um, you know, um, maybe we can make an improvement over a simple voting decision, whether soft or hard, by having another classifier. It just takes the inputs of all of my diverse predictors as as inputs, build a new classifier to combine those into a, my final prediction. Right. Um, So, uh, I just wanted to mention uh, some things about how you do that, though, uh, in order to uh, do this correctly here. So, let me see if we have a good example in the textbook of that. Um, no, not really. Yeah, so I don't really have. So yeah, the the big thing on this, I don't really the the stuff we're talking about on the boosting here um, is not. It's really this the stacking stuff from the textbook that I ask you to do for the assignment five. So, um, So the, the basic idea on this is that uh, you need to train uh, your diverse predictors uh, using your training data. So let's say we have our original data. Um, and uh, uh, we would need to split off some of this for training the predictors. So let me call that the, the, the training data uh, or the, like the training predictor. Um, so we would use that to, to train um, these models down here. Um, um, uh, to get you know, so, you know, some number of estimators um, at this level here. Right? But we wouldn't want to reuse this data that, that we're trained with uh, because uh, so to, to, to train my, the, the textbook calls this a blend, the blending. Um, so we need another estimator uh, that will take their predictions as inputs uh, and give a final prediction. Okay. Uh, but I wouldn't want to, so I need to get a data set to, to train my blender with. But I wouldn't want to use uh, the uh, uh, data that I trained these with to train it. Um, that would uh, uh, not work well. I'd be leaking um, um, I'd be leaking my um, uh, information um, about uh, how these work if we, if we use the same data set. So um, the, the correct way to, to train this additional level is I would need another data set Right, so I might you know, split my original data set into, well, I don't know what I asked for you to do on the assignment, but 60% uh, to train the original predictors, um, and do maybe 20% um, so we can do for the blending prediction, uh, and then we have another 20% that we can do for a final uh, evaluation of testing or something like that, uh, to, to test overall how this stacking model works. So, um, so given that, the, the idea then is to, to 
frame my blender, I would then um, pass through this training data to get the outputs for all these. So I'd, I'd take the data they weren't trained with, they, they were trained on this data, so I'd take the data they weren't trained with um, and create a new data set of, uh, you know, this is my output for, for, for input one on my blending data, uh, he, he predicts zero, he predicts one, predicts zero, and then this one predicts two, zero, two, and this one predicts two, one, zero. Uh, but these are the outputs uh, for the data they will not train with. So we have to generate a new data set. Um, and uh, in, in the assignment five, I asked you to do two variations of this, um, although you probably won't be able to get the second variation to be an improvement. But you can imagine, instead of just having the final prediction that I'm going to use uh, to train the blender with, um, I could uh, have, gather all of the, uh, the, the certainty, the, the probabilities of each one of these. Right? So for using the MNIST, uh, instead of just a final prediction, I would, uh, each one of these could give me uh, uh, um, the, uh, the probability of the, the 10 classes that we have. You know? So I, I think there's a 50% chance it's class 0, and maybe 25% chance it's class 1, and 0% it's a digit and I that kind of Same idea. So in one case, you, just, you would just have, if I had three, um, Estimators at the lowest level, I would, I would have uh, a data set that we use for training of just three inputs. Uh, but if, if I have uh, three estimators at the lowest level um, and I want to use the probabilities, I would have three times 10, or I'd have 30 inputs uh, in that case. Right? But, but you would use the same mechanism. You, you have to create this data set um, uh, by hand, basically. So you first uh, create some estimators on one data set, uh, and then you use this data set in order to create another set. Uh, but these are the things you try, try to predict, right? So the, uh, I'm sorry, no, these, these should be the inputs, but you'd be using the same um, per outputs or labels that you would want, right? So, you know, so for the original data, you also have your labels, uh, which would get split 60%, 20%, 20%. Um, so again, you know, uh, from this, this, this would be the input for this blender estimator, the way the textbook calls it. Uh, but um, um, uh, we still be using the, the final label, right? So for classification, if we're using MNIST, those would still be just uh, you know, some digit zero through nine, kind of given you know, either thirty inputs or three inputs. Um, and then, yeah, finally, once, you know, once you've trained these, uh, created uh, this data set so I can train the, the blender uh, for this kind of stacking, uh, then we would want to evaluate overall. So to evaluate the performance, you would want to use data that you never used for the training for these or that, which is why you need a third test or validation set um, out here. Uh, but again, to test it, you have to do a similar thing. So uh, to test it, you would take this data set and create the, the, uh, the uh, intermediate outputs that we combine for all these. And then you take that to get the final predictions in order to calculate your final accuracy um, or do a confusion matrix or whatever you need to do to find uh, the performance of the blender. Um, this kind of stuff, I mean, you do have to do this by hand. So. Um, 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 so if you if you read this chapter here, uh, you know, there is some stuff built into Scikit-Learn for the boosting, like it talks about gradient boosting, which I don't think I'm going to talk about here today. Uh, but um, um, there's no there's no API for for creating uh, stacking ensembles like this. Um, so. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, you can create a voting ensemble um, using the, uh, the, 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 the voting class from um, Scikit-Learn. Um, but here, th there's too many variables, uh, so you kind of, uh, in particular, right, you, know, you have to kind of generate 
this intermediate data set by hand, the nerd train, um, this one at the top, the blender I just talked about here. Um, but yeah, if, if you do the reading, it does discuss that a, a little bit. Um, um, but yeah, the scikit-learn doesn't support the, the stacking directly, um, so you do have to kind of implement this sort of stuff on your own here. So. Um, So I, yeah, I was trying to remember, uh, and, and um, um, I, I guess in theory you could continue doing that uh, for multiple levels, but I'm not certain that, that, uh, that I see any advantage of, of uh, having yet another level here. What are they doing here? Um, yeah, questionable, questionable to me if um, um, how much more you would ever be able to get out if, uh, if you continue on a process like that. Uh, have have more than one level of blending from your original data that you're trying to classify in there. So. Um, okay, so. So, yeah, so I think that uh, that's all I wanted to cover today. So I think I will end it uh, quite a bit earlier than I was thinking I was going to, but uh, let's go and stop there. Uh, that does cover most of the stuff that you need to know for assignment five. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't get it posted yet, but uh, hopefully today or tomorrow will be up. Um, and uh, we, can, we can discuss some more details of it on Tuesday in case anybody, once you get into and look at the actual uh, thing on it, uh, has any questions. Uh, so next Tuesday or next week, uh, we'll do some more discussions for the assignment five. So. All right, yeah, that's it. That's all. See you guys next week, hopefully.